Okay, great. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bonnie Perez Ramirez, and I am the Director for Partners Resource Networks and Projects. I'm very grateful that you are all joining us today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give a little spiel about Partners Resource Network, and then I'll let Ms. Ellison take over after that. Um, Partners Resource Network is a nonprofit agency that operates the Texas statewide network of parent training and information centers serving parents of children and youth with disabilities ages 0 to 26. And we also work with self advocates ages 14 to 26. The parent training and information centers are funded by the U.S. Department of Education Office of Special Education Program. Here in Texas, we actually have four PTIs. And um, the PEN project that you're joining here today, we serve families living in ESC regions 9, 12, and 14 through 19. So we're looking at about 122 counties here in Texas that the PEN project serves. Our mission is to empower and support Texas families and individuals impacted by disabilities or special health care needs. Okay, we have... Um, Various regional coordinators here in Texas that help parents and families free of charge. And so we are here for you. I'm going to go ahead and share the information to get in contact with us in the chat box. And um, I'll go ahead and let Ms. Ellison thank you again for, for joining us. Happy New Year. And um, I'll let you go ahead and take over from here. Thanks, Bonnie. It's a pleasure to be back with you. 2023 already. It's hard to believe, huh? Oh, so um, from a housekeeping perspective today, we are in webinar mode, so we can't see you or hear you. I always like to tell you that, um, but we do know you are there. So if you have questions today, um, if you'll just put those questions in the chat box, um, Bonnie will be watching the chat box and she'll um, read out any questions to me. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and you are going to get a copy of today's slides uh, as well as the recording after the fact. So I always like to mention that at the beginning because that usually comes up in the chat box for sure. So I'm Allison Scalbert, Consolidated Planning Group. Uh, we are a holistic special needs financial planning firm. Um, if you are attending one of our webinars for the first time, we're glad you're here. If you're um, coming back, welcome back. We, uh, again, we're definitely glad we're uh, that you're here. We have a number of webinars that we put out on a weekly basis, and they are all surrounding um, planning for special needs and various topics. We partner with other professionals, other agencies, other organizations that serve in our community um, to provide you tools and resources that are going to help you um, on your journey as it relates to planning for your loved one with a disability. Um, all of our webinars live on our YouTube channel. Um, it's Consolidated Planning Group YouTube, and you can subscribe to that YouTube channel for free. There's over 250 webinars, past webinars that are out there that you can kind of peruse the topics and, and see if they're in line of uh, what you, um, kind of the steps that you're on in your planning phase. So um, at Consolidated Planning Group, we are nationally certified as Social Security Advisors and members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. Families come to us because they want to plan for their loved one. Um, they want to plan for once the parents are gone or incapacitated or no longer able to provide the care services that they once did. So um, we put protection plans in place, um, lifetime care plans. We talk about transition planning, help set up ABLE accounts, and we do a whole lot of advocacy through these webinars. So today, um, what we are talking about is how to save on medical expenses. And, you know, the thing is, is when we have a loved one with a disability, uh, the medical expenses are often fast and furious, and we're so busy um, really looking at all of the other things that we need to not forget and not mess up, and there's so much uh, that this sometimes gets put on the back burner. Um, so we're going to go through some practical things that you can do to kind of get a handle on these things, and so that way they don't have a handle on you, because things um, things change um quickly sometimes with some of our loved ones with these diagnoses and the medical bills rack up uh, pretty quickly and it could be your loved one with a disability but maybe um, you know maybe your your child that you may have um, a, you know a, a spouse or other family member that had some you know acute situation that you weren't expecting um, things that come to mind on these types of things are strokes and heart attacks and accidents that we weren't necessarily planning on, but then the, the bills start rolling in and they're, you know, big, big time. So 
So let's let's talk about um, when it comes to um, these bills and these bills ruling. And I, I guess I, I want to start first start with the story. And this was a long time ago. It was it was over 20 years ago. But I um, I had a child with an acute illness in the helicopter in the ICU and weeks in the hospital and things like that and a grim diagnosis. And um, prior to that, I mean, I wasn't really. Um, I hadn't really gone down that highway or, or that journey. And I, you know, although we do what we do and we're very knowledgeable about insurance, financial planning and how all those things work, um, kind of being in the trenches was a whole nother story. And so, you know, we get uh, out of the hospital and a few weeks go by and then I get these giant, giant envelopes <laughs> in the mail, eight and a half by 11. And there's probably 200 pages in each envelope. And there were three of them. With, with about $250,000 worth of medical claims that had been denied by our insurance company. And talk about panic. Like, oh my gosh, it's like overnight. You're like, wait a minute, this is a quarter of a million dollars. What are we doing here? And so um, so some of this, you know, I, the, the knowledge that I have as far as working through some of this medical debt, how to, how to um, go about you know, paying things, paying things down, negotiating and working with facilities is definitely um, baptized by fire. So, so I just wanted to share a little bit about my story so you can kind of know that I'm, I'm coming into this uh, understanding how things work. So, um, so let's talk about your insurance company and if they're denying claims, you know, you know, where do you even begin? What happens? So the first things first that I always like to say that it's super, super important that you get organized. Keep and organize your bills by facilities. Um, anytime we have any type of hospital stay, it can be, start being very, very confusing because there's the doctor's billing, there's the hospital billing, and then there's these providers that slip in there that seem to be out of network and they're sending you an out of network bill, things like that. Um, you're going to want to match your EOB. So um, EOB's explanation of benefits uh, to the facility bills to make sure the amount that is owed is actually correct. Oftentimes, you will be sent a bill and the insurance has not paid yet, um, and you shouldn't pay that bill. You should wait for the insurance um, to settle. But oftentimes, in fact, I had one last week just uh, on a personal basis where um, I had been sent a bill and I actually had the EOB and the EOB said we didn't owe anything and the facility was billing. And so we were able to work it out that way. It used to be that all of your explanation of benefits were mailed to you, um, which if you have a loved one with a chronic illness, that could be overwhelming. That's a lot of EOBs. Most of the insurance companies now, um, you have a username and password. So if you have Blue Cross Blue Shield, United Healthcare, Cigna, any of them really, you have a username and password um, where you can log in and you can see, um, you can download your EOBs into a PDF. So they're kind of stored in that portal. So you don't necessarily have to have um, a paper copy unless there's a specific bill that you want to make sure you that have that paper copy to match because that they aren't matching up. Um, we want you to keep a list of phone numbers um, handy to the facilities that you owe, various departments, your insurance company. Um, and always, 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 this is super important, really make a note of who you spoke to, the day you spoke to them, the number you called, and a brief dis description of what was discussed what you agreed to or what they agreed to, okay? Um, we do often um, suggest to, if you kind of went into a payment arrangement with a facility, that you um, ask them to provide that arrangement, um, proof of that arrangement in writing. Um, some of them will say, yes, no problem, and other ones will say, we don't do that, um, but it is set up, and I can assure you it's set up. So it doesn't hurt to ask, and I like to keep that on file just in case, because ultimately, when it comes to these bills, if they're going to collection, it's your credit, right? So um, this is something, um, and again, with these medical bills, when we have a big medical bill, something big is happening in our lives, something has happened adversely to someone we love. So, and, and a lot of things can kind of have a domino effect on that. Like for instance, if we have a child that is really sick, then maybe one parent has stopped working to provide caregiving services. Um, maybe a parent lost their job and lost their insurance. There's so many situations 
uh, that that can happen when it comes to this. But it's really, really important that we keep a hold of this because because we're kind of sometimes operating in crisis mode. What a lot of people do, and if you've done this, it's okay. You can you can recover. Um, is we're on over overload um, crisis mode, and these bills start coming in. The EOBs aren't matching. The bills are wrong. And you kind of, you know, you kind of just set this aside that you're going to deal with later. And then before you know it, um, later has come and you didn't deal with it. And then it's coming back to haunt you. So let's talk about um, health insurance and, and some of the confusing things uh, that that provide, you know, confusion to a lot of people when it comes to things. So I think it's really important to understand what your medical coverage is. So a lot of families just went through an open enrollment process with their health insurance. Oftentimes it happens in the fall, sometime, sometime between late summer, early fall for your new plans that take effect January 1st. So this is a time of year where a lot of people are definitely unhappy with their insurance because their new deductibles and their coinsurance have started over new for the year where you had met your deductibles and your coinsurance for 2022. Now you've got a fresh clean slate for 2023 and you've got to hit those uh, before you know your coverage uh, basically starts paying or pays more than um, than initially. So looking at so again you have your benefits booklet when you had your open enrollment but there is a plan document usually the plan document is several hundred pages it's not just a few pages where they go over the highlights of of the plan that you have but you want to understand what is your deductible um is there a family deductible or is there like a um you know an individual deductible first how does your plan pay for instance is it an 80 20 plan uh, they pay 80%, you pay 20% until you meet your out-of-pocket maximum. Is it a 90-10 plan? Or is it a plan that maybe I, we see some, and I'm kind of fans of these too, uh, depending if you have really high health care needs, the high deductible plan where you hit that high deductible and then um, then the plan goes to 100%. So I've kind of been a fan of those because we could hit the high deductible in the first month and then the plan pays 100% for 11 months. So Sometimes um, when you're looking at your health insurance, the best plan is not the best plan after all. So you have to look at that because sometimes when you're sitting down and you're looking at your open enrollment, you're saying, I want the best plan. And in your mind, the best plan is the most expensive plan. But um, when you're looking at those most expensive plans, a lot of them have co-pays for every office visit that you go to. And there's a higher co-pay for specialists, whereas some of those high deductible plans there is no copay. You basically pay that out of pocket until you hit the deductible and then it's 100%. So for example, um, something that we went through as a family is we um, had um, someone that was going to the hospital to the facility three days a week. And when they went three days a week, they were th seeing three or four different specialists at a time. Well, if your specialist copay is $50 and you're doing it three days a week and four specialists a day every time you go, that adds up really quick. So just do the math and kind of work it backwards to see um, what might be best for you. Um, you want to pay attention to what the max out-of-pocket annual expense is. Um, and, and, and when that plan is going to go to 100% or will it ever go to 100%, is it 90%? A lot of things have changed with health insurance over the last, I don't know, say five to seven years. So some of the plans, most of the plans have gotten a lot more expensive. The coverage is less, but the, um, the premiums are more. Um, so when it comes to um, you know, a lifetime maximum, is there a lifetime maximum the carrier will pay? That really went away um, with Obamacare. There used to be, um, oftentimes there was like a million dollar ceiling on some of these health insurance plans. Where we see the lifetime maximum nowadays is your health sharing organizations, could be Altrua, uh, Christian MediShare, there's several different companies out there that do a health sharing organization, and many of them do have a lifetime maximum, so you do want to be careful with that. Um, does your plan have preferred facilities? This is the, the age-old thing that you've heard in network and out of network. 
um, that you can go to. So it's really, really important that you're getting on that portal. If you don't have a username and password for your health insurance today, put it on your list to create a username and password for your health insurance. Because on that website, they're going to be able to show you who's in network and who's not in network. And you don't want to find out after the fact, after you've gone to a facility and find out that they're out of network. And, and some plans um, where w what has happened, it used to be that you have in-network coverage and you have out-of-network coverage, but there are a lot of plans out there that do not have any out-of-network coverage. So if you go to an out-of-network facility, you could be faced with paying 100% of the bill. So you do want to check on that um, with your, your plan. Um, other plans pay much less. So maybe they pay 80% on in-network, but maybe they pay 40 or 50 percent out of network so the, for the plans that do not have coverage out of network it's they don't have coverage out of network unless it is a life-threatening emergency that could end in death okay so a broken leg is not a life-threatening emergency um you know somebody that has a, a cold or strep throat or any even COVID is not necessarily a life-threatening emergency. So that's what you need to be aware of. And so where we see a lot of these are the regional plans. So if you're purchasing health insurance in the individual marketplace, and what I mean by that is you do not have a group plan through somebody's employer, we're seeing a lot of the individual marketplace marketplace that does not have out of network. So when you're, um, you know, we just gone through open enrollment for the individual marketplace and you want to choose those plans wisely, what hospitals are in network, are your doctors in network, or if they're not in network, are you willing to change your, um, your doctors? And that's going to be important consideration. Um, one thing that's pretty um, important is does your plan require coverage to be pre-certified prior to services being um, rendered? And this is really, really common for radiology, such as MRIs or CT scans, any kind of scans, any kind of thing where you're going in for an ultrasound or some kind of um, test, usually it needs to be pre-certified. Um, I would say 10 years ago, facilities were not doing a great job at doing the pre-certification, and then people were getting bills for things that they, they dropped the ball on. But I would say that um, more recently, I think the facilities have done a really, really good job of doing the pre-certification. And you may um, recognize this because maybe um, you had someone that had a, a radiology service um, scheduled and they called ahead and said, we've checked with your insurance and you owe us $1,000 and you need to bring that $1,000 with, with you when you come to this appointment. So that is kind of an example of them doing um, some of the pre-certifications. But I experienced even last week um, where they called and they said something along those lines and they said, mm, no, we've really met our deductible and our out of pocket. No, this is what you owe and what have you. And so we kind of went back and forth and, and the bottom line is, is they really had, had not done a great job of verifying the insurance and what they verified was incorrect. And then so, um, so upon arriving, they corrected that. But so, so do, when you have your login, you can log into your insurance. You can see what have I met? What is my deductible? What have I met? What have I met towards my coinsurance? What's being applied to out of network? What's being applied to in network? That's something that you can print off. So that way, if you are having a problem with a facility that you have proof of that and you can show that as well, which may avoid you paying something uh, that you don't owe. I'm not a fan of paying something that you don't owe. And eventually, yes, the hospital will pay you back, but there's they're very quick to collect your money. And then I would say three, four or five months later, you get your refund um, is basically how that um, all works. So do work with them. And just know, um, don't be afraid to ask for a supervisor, okay? Um, sometimes um, the person that you're working with, they only have so much capacity, or they're, they're only allowed to do so much. So if you're not getting um, the answers that you need, or if you, you know, you know what you know, and it, it's kind of, you know, you know, contradicting what they're saying, definitely get a supervisor um, involved. So employer sponsored health plans. Um, so we also, a lot of employers are going to offer HSAs, FSAs, and other health plans. Um, read your group health plan documents thoroughly, checking for covered services and exclusions. Um, so this is really important if your loved one has very, you know, very specific needs that are often um, 
often not covered. Um, be be very careful and kind of looking at that and looking at what you're signing up for. Of course, a lot of times we don't have options with our group plans, um, but just know when you see those services and exclusions, this is that plan document I'm talking about. It's several hundred pages. It's a PDF. You can save it on your computer. And I love to save it on my computer because then you can search the PDF for what you're looking for. You don't have to thumb through 300 pages, right? Um, but you can search for the specific topic. Even things, drugs, procedures, other things that are excluded in your plan document may be covered um, under medical necessity. So, so if you have a loved one that needs a procedure and needs a particular drug, maybe they're allergic to all the other drugs that they allow or whatever, um, you can have your health um, healthcare provider write a letter of medical necessity uh, to get that particular um, procedure or drug or what have you covered. So it is important to know just because it says it's it's excluded. That's not taken to the bank. It's 100% excluded. I've had many, many services that were excluded on my plan covered at 100% because of the medical necessity um, ruling. So um, consider contributing to your HSA or your FSA. It allows you to save pre-tax dollars for medical expenses. So, um, you know, so we've got the um, both of those accounts are uh, oftentimes el you're eligible for that through your employer, and a lot of times people ignore it. I'm a fan of the HSA. Um, I like the HSA because the money at the end of the plan year stays in it. You don't lose it. Some of these HSAs and FSAs, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so I'm not really a fan of losing money that you're setting aside, but the HSAs are typically not like that. And so um, being, you know, smart financially, if you know you're going to have a lot of, of a lot of out of pocket expenses, your HSA can pay for those prescriptions that you're running through Walgreens or CVS or whatever can pay for those copays. There's so many things that your HSA can pay for, even some supplements and things like that. So I really max out the HSA every year. Um, and, and if you're going to spend the money anyway, it, I, I call that smart money. So just think about that and look at that. Um, I know uh, open enrollment has closed for most people. Um, sometimes you can add the HSA outside of open enrollment. So um, you may want to check on that. Um, but and oftentimes, again, very carefully look at the FSA because usually the FSA is the one that if you don't use it, um, you lose it at the end of the plan year. So <clears throat> my advice, if you're going to go with the FSA, I'm not saying that the FSA is bad. I'm just saying make sure that you only contribute the amount into the FSA that you know you're going to spend in that plan year so you don't end up losing um, money. So your health insurance has denied your health care claim. What do you do now? So, um, so first things first, I want to say that all of your insurance companies have liaisons as far as denied claims, and there is an appeal process. So you certainly can and should. It is a pain. I admit it is a pain to appeal a denied health care claim, but a lot of times um, claims are denied because a, a, a medical professional submitted a duplicate claim. They submitted the wrong procedure codes. It didn't match. There's all kinds of reasons that claims get denied. So if you're not looking at your EOBs, I mean, this could be an activity that you do is you sign into your health insurance and you go to your claims and you um, and you do a sort of denied claims. And then that's going to give you a list of any um, any denied claims. And so that would be a place that I would start um, finding out why they were denied. On the EOB, it will give an explanation of why it was denied. And sometimes you need to pick up the phone and call the provider that submitted the claim and have them work that work with them. I like to I like to call them. I like to put this on them because they have a they have skin in the game of getting paid. And so of course it would be fine for me to call the insurance company, call them, call everybody and sit on hold for an hour and all this time we we don't have all that time. So because the provider has skin in the game of getting the insurance company to pay, I like to call their departments and get them working 
uh, behind the scenes and making the calls and, 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 and working for it is kind of my opinion. Um, so the Patient Advocate Foundation, um, this is a, a good place that's worth checking uh, into. They really provide services, eliminating obstacles and access to um, quality health care. So uh, they do a lot of things, the Patient Advocate Foundation. Um, they are also um, pretty well versed in various studies. There are a lot of studies out there, um, teaching hospitals. Uh, that are, they're all across the country, the teaching hospitals, they have studies and they may have a disease specific study for your loved one with whatever you're dealing with, whether it's heart issues, cancers, it could be autism, it could be anything is my point. There could be some studies out there. So um, typically the studies are largely funded and the, the funding provides the services for, for the individual. So it may be something, and, and basically you can find out all the details of the study, what phase is the study in, what drugs are they using, what, are the, what is the intended outcome, and you can make a, a, an informed decision if that is something uh, that you are interested in for your family member. Okay, so let's talk about some myths about medical bills. Um, you guys have all heard this, um, I, I'm sure. Hospitals will never send you to collections as long as you pay something. I have heard that my whole life, honestly. Um, and the reality is that the hospital or the facility had to agree to the payment plan, okay? Um, so, so again, you've, you've heard this, even if you send them a dollar, if you send them a dollar a month, they're not going to send you to collections. It does not work that way. They do have to agree to that payment plan. Okay. Uh, another one is you should pay all the bills for your adult family member. And the reality is, is there are financial assistance programs for the indigent and disabled. They don't advertise these, you have to ask for them. And I realize that for the people out here that many of you are not indigent, um, but maybe you have an adult with a disability who is. Um, there are a lot of programs out there. And I would say um, for me, it's really worth um, just asking, okay? Um, because a lot of these facilities, especially hospitals, I'm speaking more of hospitals as opposed to like individual medical providers, a lot of these um, facilities, they don't get paid. People, people don't pay them. <laughs> and so there are a lot of programs in place and negotiating on these bills. So if you get a, a bill that is ridiculous. I, I got a helicopter bill once, um, which was really, really expensive. And my plan had paid $3,000 towards it. And um, so that was just this huge bill um, that, that we were being asked to pay for, for a helicopter. And we were able to really work with the billing office and, um, and get that bill um, down to something that was reasonable. So be an advocate for yourself and your loved one. When you don't um, understand something, definitely ask. Um, I know these EOBs can be confusing, and these bills, and the bills in themselves are confusing, especially if you have a little surgery at a hospital, and then, like I said, you've got like 15 bills from all these different, you're, you know, every way to Sunday, they're billing you, and you don't even know, like, I, getting bills for people you've never heard of, and they're somehow your physician or something, uh, yeah, that, that is definitely happening. Um, so, but what, the one main thing that I want you to make sure that you understand is a lot of the people at these um, billing centers, um, they're quite often in just a call center and they themselves may not be able to give you the satisfaction that you are looking for. Um, so let me give you an example. So let's say you've got a bill, you know, it's January and the bills are getting ready to come in and you're getting ready to get a bill for five or $6,000 because that's your deductible and your kid just had a procedure or something along those lines. Um, you, you can call and ask for that to be put on a, a payment plan. So legitimately you owe it if you haven't paid your deductible or your out of pocket maximum. Um, and a lot of these, um, these places, when you call their call center, they're trained to say, okay, well, how about one twelfth? Or, you know, sometimes they'll break it up over um, 12 months. I've seen 24 months, 18 months, um, 36 months is usually the, about as long as I've seen. So they're trained to give you this payment. And so it's okay for you to say, no, um, I'm sorry, that's not comfortable for me. I can't pay $500 a month. Actually, I was thinking 100 a month would be great. And so um, 
could, you know, they can't authorize certain things they can't authorize. So you can ask politely to speak to a supervisor. The supervisor can give you the satisfaction and the payment plan that they're needing because the person at the call center has a certain criteria that they can do and they can approve without supervisor approval. So get what you're comfortable with. Don't be afraid to say, hey, this is one of many. I've got bills all over town of the different facilities. What if that applies to you? Um, make sure that you're clear. And um, one of the other things that I suggest, again, Consolidated Planning Group, we are a holistic uh, special needs financial planning firm. I'm not a huge fan of um, dropping a $25,000 check or a $5,000 check for the bill either. I am more of a fan of doing the payment plan. And the reason why is these facilities don't charge interest. I've actually seen one ever in my whole career that started charging interest and it wasn't in Texas. So when it comes to these bills, these, you know, these large deductibles or coinsurance that you have, getting it up on a payment plan that you can comfortably afford to set aside on a monthly basis is a smart thing because you can keep your, your money. If you had the $5,000 to just write a check for it, you can keep your money working for you, earning interest while you're paying a bill that is not um, building interest against you. So just think about that. Um, so again, the supervisors are going to typically going to have better solutions for you. One thing I will mention is if you ask to speak to a supervisor, oftentimes you're going to be told by the representative that there is not a supervisor available at this time and can they call you back? Say yes. Um, I, my history is that they actually do call you back. It might be a few days, but if, if they haven't called you back in two or three days, call them back and ask to speak to a supervisor again. But that is pretty common, so don't think that they're giving you a runaround. That is pretty common. Um, also, be informed of any nonprofit organizations that specifically help patients with various diseases, conditions. Um, sometimes they also provide small financial aid or grants to applicants um, that qualify. I mean, I, I can think of various um, cancer organizations, heart association organizations. There's so many d disease specific organizations out there. So do check and do check early because when the funds run out with these organizations, the funds run out. So just be, you know, think about any of the diagnoses that might be in your hospital and in, in your household, and then um, look up those organizations that serve um, those specific diseases. And you can kind of see if there might be some assistance uh, to, for you on that. Um, the other thing is, is it's not always, um, it's not always clear. You can ask for this charity care application. So some people would say, oh, we make too much money. We're not going to apply for charity care. Um, there, so it might be called a financial assistance application. It could be called a charity care application. It could be called anything for the indigent or disabled or things like that. You should ask for um, those, those applications. And we're going to um, kind of talk a little bit more about that. So um, following up uh, with the communications with the facility, we do want you to follow up, correspond with facilities in writing. They must respond to all written requests and then you have a paper trail. If arrangements were made by phone, again, ask them to send you a copy of what they agreed to. It's really important that you don't let bills go to collections. So once they've gone, it's too late to make arrangements, okay? so. If you're applying for a charity care app, um, application or if you're making payment arrangements, it's important that you've asked them to make a note. I want to make sure that you've made a note on this account that it's not going to go to collections, that I'm in a payment arrangement with you or that I am pending approval for a uh, financial assistance application, those types of things. So if it's been a while and now you're applying for financial assistance, financial assistance sometimes takes a little time to get approved. Um, but it definitely can um, and does get approved on a pretty regular basis. Just don't put those medical bills in, the, in that pile of deal with later because um, if you're like most people, that, that pile is um, ever growing and it's harder to get back to it because life happens. So do what you agreed to do when you agreed to do it. If you said, listen, I agree, $100 a month. I owe you $10,000 and I'm going to pay $100 a month and I agree to a bank draft on the first of every month and do the bank draft. If um, if you have to send it in by the first of every month, then make sure that you um, send that in by the first of every month. And so, because all bets can be off. So if they make an arrangement with you and you agreed to pay the first of every month and, and then the 15th you hadn't paid, 
then you can lose that agreement. Um, another thing is, is once you have a payment arrangement, so and you've paid on it for a while, you can renegotiate that payment arrangement. So maybe it was $200 a month. And maybe you've been paying it for six months and um, you have showed that you pay on time every every time and you've paid that balance down. Sometimes they'll renegotiate with you and they'll take that payment down, okay? So again, I know a lot of people don't like like the idea of ongoing payments and things like that. But again, allowing your money to work for you, um, you know, assuming that you had the money to just flat out pay a huge bill. Um, but if not, it's in an affordable place. So that way it's not going against your credit and um, and, and and hurting you that way. It, I, I think what happens to a lot of people, they start getting these bills from all these people they don't know or the bills are wrong. The EOBs are wrong. The whole time is long to call the insurance company or you talk, talk to somebody at the facility and they weren't helpful. And what happens is people get really frustrated and they say, well, if this is such a mess, then forget it. I'm just not even going to deal with it, which in theory sounds fine, except for in the end, you're hurting yourself. You're hurting your credit uh, in the long term, and you've already got enough on your plate to be even attending this webinar or dealing with um, what you're dealing with at your house uh, anyway. So let's not make um, credit an issue. I, I don't know what just happened to my slides. Let me get back here. Sorry about that. Um, where were we? Okay, so we're going to talk about... Um, we're going to talk about the sample letter to the facilities. Um, okay, yes. Let me see. So we've got the communication. So uh, the sample letter to the facilities, this is where if you're asking for financial assistance, and this is where even when you say, hey, we make too much money, we can't ask. You know, so what if you make too much money? Maybe you've got bills here, there, and everywhere. Maybe you've got $100,000, but now they're in medical debt. They don't know your story. Maybe your house flooded in Harvey. Maybe you've had um, other major um, life changes. Maybe you've had a death of a breadwinner. Maybe your loved one got sick and you had to quit your job or you lost your insurance. Something happened. Tell your story. So don't be afraid to ask for the financial assistance application. But this is an example of a sample letter. Um, that you can send along with your financial application. So don't lie on your financial application. Be honest about your assets. Sometimes they ask for proof of tax returns. They ask for all kinds of proof. So you've got to provide honest answers on the financial assistance application, but a letter going along with it to tell your story on why you need help why it might look on paper like you don't need help, but why you do need help. So today, when we send out the slides today, we are going to send a copy of this sample letter too, and we will send it in a, um, a Word format so that way you can um, edit the, the, the letter and kind of make it your own. But this is a good example of something that should go along with a financial assistance application. So what if your financial assistance application is denied? Okay, challenge accepted. So once it's denied, that doesn't mean, okay, we're going to tuck our tail and run and we're not going to talk anymore about it. This is where the second letter goes out and says, thank you for your um, correspondence. Um, I recently received a, a, a note that you guys have denied my financial um, application. I'm asking for this. I'm, I'm asking to appeal this decision, decision. I'm asking for this to go to the board for further review. And I don't think you um, completely understand my situation. Okay. So what is happening in some of these facilities? So here's what I've seen with these financial assistance applications. I've seen $100,000 bills completely wiped out. I've seen hundred thousand dollar bills um, reduced to five grand. Um, I have seen um, I've seen facilities, and this is worth asking. So let's just say um, where you had the money. So you're being billed five thousand dollars. You do owe it. You've checked your EOB, and you do owe it, and you have the money, and you'd like to just get this out of the way. Um, it is worth it for you to ask the facility, what is, uh, what is the lowest price you will take if I pay this in full today? Um, I have seen bills, 5000 any kind of amount, reduced um, as, as much as 50% if you pay in full that day. So it is, worth, um, it is worth you asking if they will give you a discount if you pay in full. Um, how are we on questions? Do we have any questions before we um, keep moving? No, we don't. Okay. 
So what about taxes? This is where it comes up a lot too. Um, you know, what is a deductible medical expense and when to use it? So generally medical expenses are needed need to be more than seven and a half percent of your adjusted gross income on your tax return to itemize and deduct those expenses. So a lot of families um, don't hit this. So although your medical expenses are quite high because of the seven and a half percent of your household AGI, um, and unless it's more than that, then you um, you really can't deduct them. Understand that not all medical expenses are deductible. Um, some of your alternative medical procedures and remedies may be deductible if you follow those re rules. And of course, as you're going along, you want to keep those receipts of anything that you have paid for, especially any of the out-of-pocket expenses and things like that. Okay, we have um, a question. Okay, sure. Okay, um, I was given incorrect information by the insurance and was told the provider was in network that in fact wasn't. I have been trying to get a refund for the premium for three months and I just get the runaround. What should I do? Okay. So in, in the example where you were um, told that the person was in network and they weren't, they weren't usually you can call that um, the bill, um, whoever, whoever the provider was and, um, and advise that, um, that they that you were told that they were in network and they were were not and asked them to bill as out of as in network as opposed to out of network a lot of them are willing to um, go ahead and bill you as in network as opposed to getting nothing so i would start there um i you can also um, file a complaint with your insurance company so you can call um, and ask to be escalated to a supervisor. Um, and also, if you're in a group health plan, I want to mention this. Don't be afraid to get your HR representative um, from the company involved. If you're having a problem with the health insurance, there is an HR uh, liaison that works for your company that works with the insurance company. So if you're having a problem and you've tried to solve it with the insurance company, you're going round and round and you're getting nowhere, get HR involved because they have a friend in high places at the insurance company and it's surprising how they get things done. So don't be afraid to ask that or to get HR involved. They are there to help you and they also do want to know. I mean, um, the company is picking this insurance company because they, they think that they're gonna provide good services to their uh, employees and if they're you know getting the runaround, they do want to know about that. And they and I have personally had um, a good experience by getting HR involved. Um, for one thing, I had um, this was last year, and it took a year. It did take a year, but I had some significant out of network claims that were being denied and they shouldn't have been denied. And so by getting HR involved, I got the liaison in high places at the, um, the health insurance company and they worked with the facility and they worked with us. And at the end of the day, um, almost every bit of the out-of-pocket expense was reimbursed. It did take a long time. Um, but once we got that liaison on, in place with the insurance company, she was amazing and she really got stuff done. And then it helped me because I was able to work with her directly as opposed to calling the 800 number and starting this whole scenario over again, which is, I find super, super annoying. I mean, it's like, how many times can we talk about the same story? And um, so this person knew the story. I didn't have to repeat the story. And we um, together worked through it and got stuff done. All right, deductible medical um, tax expense uh, definition. So what I will say is I'm not a CPA and I don't play one on TV, okay? So we don't really give tax advice, but just know uh, that from the IRS publication 502, medical and dental expenses, the cost of diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease, and the cost for treatments affecting any part or function of the body. Okay, those can be uh, deductible. It does not include expenses that are merely beneficial to the general health, such as vitamins or vacation. And it can include um, um, it can include things from a holistic. Uh, practitioner or naturopaths or homeopaths as well. Okay, so you might want to look up those as far as the taxes are concerned. But again, the seven and a half percent of AGI, adjusted gross income, your receipts need to be more than the seven and a half percent of AGI. So that is why most people are not itemizing their um, 
their medical expenses. So let's talk about what if your kid is in private school, is that medically deductible? And that depends if some, if there are therapies being provided, it might have a portion of it. If there's like various OTPT or different types of therapies. Um, what if we have a caregiver? Is that a medical expense? And so nannies are not a medical expense. Babysitters are not really a medical expense. But if you have a caregiver that has some type of certification, a nursing certification, or it's a specialized caregiver uh, to be able to handle um, any type of critical care, some kids have trachs, some kids have G-tubes, um, ventilators, other things like that, then it is possible you're going to want to work with a CPA on that if you think you're going to be over that 7.5% of the AGI of what type of caregiver expenses could be covered. Um, okay. So not everything is going to be deductible. You already uh, mentioned that. Do you have a prescription um, of the medical condition from your physician? Do you have a receipt or a statement from the treatment for the service? Um, there are other requirements, but these are the first steps, and you can look that up. I mean, the 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 law, kind of the tax law, talk about boring. You can look that up and kind of see. But I would say just work with a CPA, and they should be able to help you um, with that. We do have. Uh, a CPA in Texas that is nuanced and working with families uh, with special needs, so she may be able to help as well. So we have talked about a lot as far as, you know, um, the medical debt. I know that this is frustrating, but I just want to encourage everybody not to give up, um, kind of roll up your sleeves and take charge of this. There is help out there. I find it frustrating because I feel like some of these billing and the insurance companies and the billing, it sometimes it feels like they're kicking us while we're down because you already have these bills because something's going on. Somebody's sick, something has gone wrong, somebody needed a procedure, things like that. But but don't give up. Do do know that there are a lot of tools and resources out there to help you so it does not go to collections. And um, really, you know, again, work with your HR department. Um, say next, if you're talking to the customer service representative at the billing facility and they're not helpful, ask to speak to um, ask to speak to a supervisor. Um, ask for physician approval. Most of these like um, medical practices, these small um, medical practices, they're going to negotiate with you less, but some of them will still negotiate with you. And maybe the staff told you no, but say, I would like to send an email. Could you see to it that it gets to the practice management or I speak to the office manager of the practice? Those are some places that you can get some help. So we've come to um, to the end of our um, of our talk today on, on, on medical bill advocacy. And so again, today you guys are going to get a copy of today's slides. You are going to get um, a sample uh, letter that we have in a Word document that you can edit if you ever want to apply for financial assistance and send the letter along with it. Um, these are just some things that should be on your special needs planning radar. Um, we have webinars on all of these topics. All of the past webinars live on our YouTube channel. And um, we put out an email about once a month of all of our webinars for the month, and you can register always for free. All of our webinars are always free, but we do um, have specific um, whole hour webinars on every one of these topics. So the, the thing is, is it is complicated. The stuff that we go through as parents and what we have to know about all of this stuff, um, it is complicated. So we have dedicated webinars for each of these specific topics to help you navigate uh, through those. Um, Bonnie, do we have any additional questions? Well, um, I know it's that we have something in the chat that says, um, my insurance allows 90 sessions per year for therapy. My child needs more than that. Um, I've appealed two times to ask for more sessions and have been denied. Am I wrong in thinking they can provide more sessions? So I think this is going to come down to the medical necessity and sometimes appeals do get denied and it's kind of like one of those theories like I said if you apply for like assistance and they say no don't take no for an answer write them again okay and it's kind of the same thing on the appeal um don't take no for 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 an answer um you know, appeal again, get HR involved. But I think where this comes really, really, it's really important. Sometimes your appeals are denied because it didn't come together with a letter of medical necessity. Having multiple letters of medical necessity of what they've tried before and it didn't work are the reasons why 
uh, the individual needs more therapy sessions, um, I, I think that that's worth, um, definitely worth trying for. I mean, I've had things um, where there was one time years ago where um, they, the insurance company unilaterally decided that um, one of the meds that one of my kids took that they weren't going to cover it anymore. And my kid was allergic to all these other meds. And then they were like, this one is going to be better. But yet she had, you know, obviously care providers that didn't think so. So now wait, the insurance company is deciding what med is best for her. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and, you know, so, so, you know, I had to go through that before and, and it is frustrating, um, but you can make some headway and don't get mad. Um, just <laughs> make it happen. Just make it your mission that, no, nope, this is going to be the, in the best interest for myself, for my family, for, for whatever. And work very closely with your physicians. Your your physicians are clear on what a letter of medical necessity is, and they will write them for you. They don't like it. It takes time out of their time. They don't like to do that. Um, but when you have strong letters of medical uh, necessity, I think that 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 gives you a lot um, more you know leg to stand on. And then also for therapies, and and I don't know, it's none of my business or anything, but some a lot of times when we have kids on the spectrum, that you know it's cut off on the therapies that they can get and stuff like that. But there are organizations, for instance, you know there are various autism organizations that do have um, some offset to where they'll help out with some of the therapies, maybe above and beyond insurance didn't cover. So that's where. I was saying, you know, reaching out to the, any disease specific organization or di diagnosis specific organization and some of that financial um, help might be related to something along those lines. So it's definitely worth uh, looking at. So I would like to introduce my team. I work on an awesome team here at Consolidated Planning Group of highly um, educated professionals. And I always just like to put a face uh, with their name. Uh, again, we are nationally certified as Social Security Advisors and members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. We offer, we always offer free consultations. So anytime we're having a webinar, there's always people that have questions that maybe they didn't want to put in the chat. That, um, or they want to um, have kind of a one-off conversation. Um, so when you get this, um, this copy of the slides later, um, all of these icons down here are links to the YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, the website, all of that. And then you can um, put your camera over this and this will take you to a calendar. So if you're interested in scheduling a free personalized consultation, you can meet with our team um, and the calendar will come up and you can pick a date that works best for you. Um, and that's all I have for today. Do we have any additional questions before we close? Yes, we did have one more that says, would you please give us the name of the TPA you mentioned? I, you broke up. I didn't hear. Please give us the name of the what? CPA that you had mentioned. Yes, and we will put that in the email that goes out today. Her name is Teresa Ferruzzo. She is in the greater Houston area, but Teresa Ferruzzo, she is a CPA and she is nuanced and working with special needs. And so we commonly refer uh, to her, but we will um, we'll add that to the email. So you're going to get the slides, the recording, and we'll put her contact um phone number and email address um, in the body of the email today. So thanks so much, Bonnie. It's always a pleasure. Um, pleasure to be back with you again. I know we've got some additional things scheduled, so we'll look forward uh, to getting together again. And thank you, everybody, for spending your hour with us today. Take thank care. Thank you so much. Happy New Year, everyone. For sure. Bye now.